everyone, John Lorden here. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch, Case Cracked. You know, when I was a kid, Halloween was one of my favorite times of year. I really liked either dressing up as something that I wanted to be, or sometimes dressing up as something that scared me <laughs> or scared other people. Uh, unfortunately, the case we're looking into today takes place on Halloween, and a little girl is just trying to have a good time. Unfortunately, it ends in tragedy. So uh, let's jump into the case of the Madman and Mary Stiles. Halloween 1985, Baytown, Texas, about 30 miles outside of Houston with a population of around 60,000 people at that time. Mary Stiles was 11 years old, a sixth grader at Horace Mann Junior School that was part of a large family with one sister and six brothers. She loved music and was learning to play violin. She'd come home each day and show her father what she was learning, and he'd learn the same pieces along with her. For Halloween that year, she decided she wanted to dress up like a baby. She put on Care Pair pajamas, wore a pacifier around her neck, and her sister, Carrie, put Mary's hair up in pigtails. Just after 4 p.m., Mary asked her father if she could walk up to the main office of the apartment complex that they lived at with some friends. Apparently, the office had a coffin that was filled with candy for trick-or-treaters. Her father agreed, and she headed out. Around dinner time, her family started getting nervous. They hadn't seen or heard from Mary since she left. They asked the local kids if they knew where Mary was, but no one had an answer. Her father, Gary Stiles, ended his search and called 911. Police responded quickly to Wood Hollow Apartments where Mary lived. Her family provided them with a picture and a description of her Halloween costume. Law enforcement searched the apartment complex, the woods behind it, even the cars in the parking lot, but they were not able to find young Mary. They spoke to the people in the apartment building management office who said that she did indeed show up there and she did take some candy, but no one had seen her after that. Her father stayed up all night waiting for a phone call, but none would happen. The next day, Gary reached out to local news stations to spread the word about his missing daughter. Hundreds of tips started coming into the police department, but as they worked each one, they found that none of those tips had any useful information. Days started passing with no significant developments on the case. The community grew very concerned for Mary and the safety of their own children as police reviewed their list of usual suspects. About a week later, police would get their first break in the form of a letter mailed directly to them. The envelope was clear. It read, urgent, Mary Stiles, immediate. Immediate was misspelled using only one M and there was no return address. Inside was a newspaper clipping about Mary and a hand-drawn map. The map showed the location of Mary's body as well as several locations where different parts of her attack occurred. Other words were also misspelled on the map and the author instructed police to find her and give her a decent burial. The bottom was signed, the madman who wishes he never was. According to the map, her body was indeed in the woods behind the apartment complex, and it even showed exactly what trail they would have to take to find her. Soon after, officers would check that location and learn that the map was very accurate and most likely drawn by the killer. They had finally found the body of Mary Stiles under the roots of a fallen tree, still in her Care Bear pajamas. Medical analysis concluded that she had been stabbed in the neck four times, strangled, and she also had a sock stuffed into her mouth. Uh, they weren't positive which method was responsible for her actual death. She had defensive wounds on her arms and hands. Despite being found with her pajama bottom slightly pulled down, there was no evidence of a sexual attack. Nine days after she went missing, her family was coming back from a trip an attempt to regain some sense of normalcy for the rest of the children. They stopped at a store and Gary's father went in. He noticed they were taking down Mary's missing poster from the store window. He asked why and learned that his granddaughter's body had been found. He went back to the vehicle and broke the news to his son. 
Police started looking further into their best clue, the map and the envelope. The postmark was clear. It was actually sent from within Baytown. They found fingerprints on the map, but there was no match for them on file. They looked at the writing, trying to put together some form of profile of what type of person this was. The misspells, the sloppy text. Was this someone that was uneducated or possibly even someone with a mental issue of some type? They sent the map to the FBI for further analysis. The investigation seemed to slow down once again as leads were exhausted. Another clue would eventually show up in the mail. The writing on the envelope matched the first one, but this envelope contained a letter, again signed by the madman. It spoke about him struggling with what he had done. Police also sent this letter to the FBI to help with their analysis. Shortly thereafter, a third letter would appear and dramatically change the tone. This one laid out a game that the killer wanted to play, demanding that the police post correct answers to several riddles on the front page of the Baytown Sun newspaper. The madman then threatened further violence, telling police if they didn't, or if they got the answers wrong, then the price will be paid. Police reviewed the riddle, which seemed related to Egyptian lore, and they believed they had the correct answer, Anubis. They had the newspaper drop the word Anubis into an article on the front page. They didn't want to raise the anxiety of the already concerned citizens by letting everyone know that they were playing the madman's game to avoid further violence. Another letter showed up, letting them know that they were wrong. It reasserted the threat, but gave police another chance to answer the question. They continued their research and learned that in, in Egyptian lore, Anubis's task was eventually replaced by Osiris. They contacted the paper and planted their new answer. It seems that this time they were correct. No one died and another letter showed up with a new riddle, this time related to Roman mythology. They did their research, planted the word Neptune in the newspaper, and waited for the next turn. Before it could show up, the FBI responded with a profile of the killer create, created by their behavioral scientists, which sent police looking in a completely different direction. The FBI said it was likely a youth, 15 to 16 years old, previously police had been focusing solely on adults, and that he lived nearby and very likely had good knowledge of the apartment complex and the woods behind it. Most importantly, they said it was probably someone that Mary knew. They even said that there's a good chance that the letters were being sent from the mailbox directly in front of the complex. Police arranged video surveillance on that mailbox, tracking every person that used it. They had a post inspector at the location to check and remove each letter as it was dropped in. Some thought it was a waste of resources and time, but police would finally get the big break they were waiting for. A young man in a black leather jacket rode up on a bicycle. He hunched over the mailbox as he dropped in a letter and then he took off. The post inspector opened the mailbox. The only letter in there was another one from the madman to the police department. An undercover officer followed the young man back to his apartment, but they didn't act just yet. They kept him under surveillance while police verified that the handwriting was indeed a match. The young man was Joseph Lee Fordham, 16 years old, and he appeared to be a solid match to the FBI's profile. His 10-year-old stepsister was one of Mary's best friends. He would even frequently walk Mary home from their place after dark. They kept him under surveillance and saw Joseph taking out a bag of trash to the dumpster. They recovered the bag and found drafts of more madman letters and even a copy of the map that he had sent to the police department. They now knew that they had their man. They processed search warrants in his home and his school locker. They found a book of mythology in his locker with one of the pages marked by the corner being bent. The page was all about Osiris. In his bedroom, they found the knife that was used on Mary. They arrested the 10th grader. Arresting officers say that he seemed to have no remorse at all. Fordham even confessed to them about what he had done, but when asked what the motive was, he had no answer. He was eventually convicted of aggravated murder and sentenced to 25 years, largely due to his young age. Now, 
if you thought that that is the good ending to this nightmare that happened on Halloween in 1985, unfortunately there is yet another twist in this story. Due to prison crowding, Fordham was released after serving less than eight years of his 25-year sentence. While he may be currently out of jail, I don't know if he's necessarily a free man. Since his release, he's had other prison stints, more run-ins with the law, and in 2014, he attempted suicide. I guess he still is the madman that wishes he never was. Case cracked. Um, I also wanted to let you guys know that the show on the case with Paula Zahn did a feature on this earlier this year. It's really good. There is a lot of detail that I didn't get to in this episode. Um, you get to see the family members. You get to see some of the investigators that worked on this case. If you're interested in this story, I really highly recommend you check it out. You can find it on Amazon.com. Just look for Season 15, Episode 8. Um, it's only a few dollars to purchase that one particular episode, and I really think that it'd be worth your time if you're interested in this case. Um, just a, a terrible story, and if you do look into this case, you'll even hear more about Fordham's backstory, about the type of um, kind of busted up family life that he had, some other violence that had occurred in his family that maybe motivated him in some way into this type of life. It's just, it's really sad on, on many fronts. And of course, the main thing is what happened to Mary and the fact that her family, all of her siblings lost out on all that time with her. Um, I have to say, since I've been looking into cases, I have also noticed this kind of weird trend about, uh, for some reason, when children are murdered, uh, the sentences aren't always that stiff. Uh, even the, the, people seem to be upset that he even only got 25 years instead of a life sentence for this. Uh, and then, of course, he winds up serving less than eight. And I, I kind of have to agree with that. There's this weird thing that I've seen time and time again in cases like this where those sentences just don't seem to match the crime. When someone is that young and their life is taken away, there is so much opportunity and years and everything that is taken away from them. But for some reason when older people uh, are murdered, it seems like the penalties get stiffer. And when you think about that, there's less time that's actually been taken away for those people. So I don't know, uh, I might have to do uh, some more research on that, maybe do an episode of Johnny Vlogs or something kind of talking about that dynamic, because it's definitely something I've noticed. And um, thankfully, at least Mary's sister has spoken up about the fact that she has come to terms uh, with what Fordham has done. She has really tried her best to forgive him and to not be angry about the fact that justice seemed to arrive and then kind of took off in this case in a really strange way. But that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here. I appreciate each and every one of you that watches. Come back tomorrow to the Lord Narch channel for more. I'll see you there.